righty, so this is class number 11. Number 11. So that puts us right in about week six, if I'm correct. And we missed one video due to a storm that didn't hit us. So that's why we're kind of slightly off by one. It should be 12, but that's okay. So we're in, so we are in week six, I think so. So if I, we're looking at the um, syllabus, you know, we're still kind of in the, you know, you, you start with the founding principles and we're kind of like going through the legislative branch and the constitution. So we're gonna do a little bit of that, a little bit with that. Uh, who watched the video from Tuesday? Two people, okay. So if you watch the video from Tuesday, please watch the videos because you're missing half the, the semester if you don't. Uh, we, we had discussed quite a bit of things. We, we discussed kind of what was going on. I think I, I even gave a um, extra credit assignment, correct? There was an extra credit assignment. Do you recall that? Mm -hmm. What was it? Yeah, I, I wrote recall. it down. Yeah. I recorded it, <laughs> so I got to go back oh, and watch. Watch, it. watch the debate. And oh, a little late if you didn't. Uh, yeah. Who watched the debate? Yeah. It's very difficult to watch. Mm -hmm. um, I watched the whole thing. In fact, it was very frustrating to me. Uh, of course, it's frustrating to me as a philosopher. I mean, you know, I'm a philosophy professor, also by trade, and so I don't like the format, and so. Uh, you go, well, okay, well, part of it is, uh, part of the problem was, you go, well, they're interrupting each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you go, well, Trump's such a jerk, because he's always interrupting. Maybe, but maybe that was by design. We don't know, I don't know. Um, maybe he's stupid. But then, you know, I broke down, all, oh, he was called racist. Who, who heard that one? I heard white. Yeah, called a, now, that was an interesting thing. Chris Wallace is so let, allegedly supposed to be not biased. Now, I don't believe that he is, okay? And I don't believe he particularly ha, has a fondness for Trump. What if I came up to you and said something like an interview or you're in a debate and then I demanded of you, I said, are you ready? And just like that, literally, that was how it was said. Are you ready to, what was it? What was the word you said? To kind of like uh, denounce. Are you ready to denounce white supremacist groups? You know? Well, what? Why would he ask that question? Did he ask Joe Biden that in the same manner? Mr. Biden, are you ready to denounce white supremacy? I mean, isn't it kind of implied? It's kind of like asking, do you still beat your wife? You know, that's a loaded question. Right? It's kind of like presupposes he beats his wife. You know, it's like, come on, President, we know you're a racist. Are you ready to denou denounce it by now? Uh, you know, that, and I'm like, okay, I, I would have been upset, okay? So he goes, what did, what, did, what did Trump say? Sure. Yeah. Then he was interrupted by Joe, who they're interrupting each other. This and, this. and then he goes, <laughs> He goes, well, well, give me a name. Give me a name. Who do you want me to denounce? He goes, and as he's in this melee of, intro, you know, in, in this melee of being interrupted by him, Joe Biden, and Chris Wallace, right? He goes, the, the Proud Boys, okay? He, Trump doesn't. Wallace does. He goes, well, I, I'm just stand down, stand by, I guess, or whatever, you know? And he just, he throws it out there, and the news focused on the standby part as though he's given the Proud Boys marching orders, you're gonna stand by, because we're gonna, we're gonna, okay? Now, by the way, the Proud Boys are allegedly accused of being racists. Now, I've watched some Proud Boys videos. 
and they are not, they've got, it's kind of a multi-ethnic group, okay, of guys. So who are the Proud Boys? Are they rednecks? No, they're not really rednecks. But if you want to call them rednecks, I mean, they're conservative men who are going out to these Antifa riots in like, you know, in, you know, uh, in Seattle and they're waving back the blue flags, you know, the flag with the blue line in it. And they're waving Trump flags and American flags, mostly American flags and the back the blue flags. And they basically kind of stand between Antifa and Antifa trying to destroy stuff. And then a bunch of fights have broken out and you know, a bunch of Antifa guys have gotten beat up, okay? Who knows who Antifa is? They're a group that calls themselves anti-fascists. They're the ones burning down all the buildings and the cities. Same guys in parts of the Black Lives Matter movement, okay? And they're a Marxist organization and they're the real deal Marxists, okay? They're like, they're, they're, they're the guys with the shields. They're making shields and putting a hammer and sickle on it. Hammer and sickle is a sign of communism, symbol of communism, okay? And um, so they're going out fighting these guys. And then this group called the Southern Poverty Law Center has labeled them a race, uh, racist organization, okay? But what makes them racist? I don't know. I have, I've looked at their website, I've listened to an order, and they deny it, and some of their leaders are certainly other than white people, okay, they're not white, not all of them, for sure. I'm sure they're predominantly white, but so is the whole nation. Now, that's not a defense of beating people up, but it is questioning whether or not, and Mike Wallace thinks they're a, um, not Mike Wallace, uh, Chris Wallace, Mike Wallace is his dad, he says he's dead, um, another news guy. But uh, just said, threw that name out there, okay? And so he's like, nah, sure. So anyway, he got, so the news now is focused on what? Stand by, is, you know, and so Trump didn't deny he's a racist. But of course, before then, he's like, yeah, sure, I'm a, of course I denounce that stuff, okay? So it was an interesting debate because of that uh, type of stuff. Wallace kept asking those kind of questions, these, what they call in the industry, gotcha questions, and then he'd give them like two minutes to answer. I just called you a racist, okay, implied it. Can you, and, and then, can you defend that in two minutes? No, I, I, I say I'm not racist, I like everybody, uh, but you know, come on, y'all heated. So it was an ugly debate. But what I did notice is now that the uh, debate's over, you can watch the news and you can see all the sound bites. And I'm like, you know, you could, those sound bites will last longer than that hour and a half debate. So for those people who didn't watch the debate, they get the sound bites. And if you're in advertising, that's what counts. That's what counts. If you watched the, the sausage being made that night, you're like, God, that was ugly. But if you look at the sound bites and it goes, Biden, you know, uh, denies AOC's Green New Deal. Uh oh, well, now the socialists are like, wait a minute. You know, um, you know Trump calls out Biden for not distancing himself from Antifa. Is Antifa really just an idea or are they terrorists? You know, and you know, you get these sound bites. I'm like, oh, maybe he's a genius. I don't know. Okay. Now I didn't like it. I'm, 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 I prefer that they have 20 minute opening statement. Each one gets 20 minutes. The next 15 minutes, they get a 15 minute rebuttal each 15 minutes. Uh, then five minutes each goes from 20 to 15 to five. And then a closing statement of maybe five minutes, maybe some questions afterwards by the audience, not by some moderator who is Bias, you get a bunch of biased people in the audience who get up hold of mic and go, hey, Joe, what did you mean by that? Or, hey, Trump, I don't like you, so I want to challenge you. And then, you know, you see how that works. Uh, it gives you a lot more time to develop your argument, but I, I don't know where, how news organizations decided they knew better. Um, and that thing, the, the biggest questions in life could be answered in two minutes. Anyway, so well, that, that took place, and that was for, um, to help, 
people decide whether or not they wanted to vote for one of the other guys. And maybe more people walked away going, I'm not voting at all. Um, that was one thing that happened. So part of your, your guys' assignment was, uh, which by the way, I'm gonna change the due date officially, uh, is to come to class with a list of things that are going on in our nation, our world, and even in our city and state, because this is a class on politics or government, and we wanna know what's going on both locally, uh, state, uh, statewide, and federally. I said both, but I mean all three of these. So tell me, uh, and then after that, I also wanna know where you got your news from, because I also want you guys to be able to challenge yourself as to ask, as in asking yourself, where do I get my news? Who do I trust to tell me what to believe? Okay, who do I like? You know, and, and, you know, because changing the channel and listening to somebody who doesn't like you can be very uncomfortable. So like I listen to certain news stations, and I do, and I go, man, that person hates my guts. Like if I watch The View, man, they, I'll tell you what, I would get the impression those people just, if they, they had me on there, they would just be like <laughs> all over me, they'd hate me. Joy Behar, come on. She becomes the worst person in the world. <laughs> You're, you know. What's going on in, in the world? Well, I look up um, on Google on Tuesday, right, as you said, it was Thursday. And the only thing that I could find was about the debate. Um, I did look up um, this Cortez um, person. Descartes? The socialist one? Did I get the dead? Um, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez? Yeah, yeah. Sounded like you said Descartes, and I was like, no, that's Descartes, but that's, no, no, like, no. <laughs> that's philosophy. Um, sorry, Cortez, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Yeah, because you said she's openly um, communist, and I looked at uh, Yeah, she would call herself socialist. I call her a Marxist, and I think that's correct. She, I would challenge her. She, I'd like to ask her. Tell me, are you a Marxist? And, and I mean, she'd probably say no, or or change the subject. But I, I, you know, there's, you know, if the shoe fits, you wear, okay? Yeah. So I mean, the shoe seems to fit. So I mean, she certainly likes uh, the Marxist uh, Bernie Sanders, who he has no problem wearing that moniker. Go ahead, though. So yeah, I looked it up, and basically. She says that we need to change over to modern socialism. Yeah, what's the difference? Yeah, so, I mean. Let me ask you a quick question. What did the KKK say? We need to change to modern racism, right? Right. It's still racism, right? Yes. Okay, so let's not, it's, it's democratic socialism. It's still socialism. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what is that? So what what does that mean? Um, does she even know? I don't think so. She only said like, on what I read, she just said like, um, we need to change to like be better, and we need to change our mind. But what does better mean to her? I don't know. I guess um, I don't know. <laughs> no, that's right. I mean, no, that's good. That's good. Look, if she were on the hot seat. And speaking for herself, I go, what would you mean by better? Uh, I, I, I wonder to what degree she would be able to say. She said, we need to not be so greedy, perhaps. Got to get rid of the billionaires or whatever. Yeah. Perhaps she'd say, so we need to not be racist. Well, who's not, I mean, who, okay, first of all, when it comes to racism, what normal human being wouldn't agree with that, okay? There's nothing weird or controversial about stuff like that. We need to be more moral, but, but I mean, what is, but then you can start going, well, what do you mean by the issues? Let's talk about the issues. Let's talk about social issues such as abortion, drug use. Let's talk about uh, immigration. Let's talk about crime. Let's talk about the federal government, the powers of the federal government. Where, where's the boundary between the federal government's control over my life and, and the state's control over their, where, where they, you know, their domain? And where's, how does that impact my freedom of speech, my freedom of religion, my freedom of movement, my freedom to own a business, my freedom to make as much money as I darn well please? 
okay? My freedom to hire who I want, right? And then the devil is in the details, right? How much are you gonna spend on the military, AOC? Uh, how much money are you, know, you going to give to people of my money, right? Because she is in what branch of government? She's in the legislative branch, and she's also specifically in the House of Representatives, where they're, they're tasked with levying taxes. So she could raise taxes, right? So she believes that they should take more money. Are you gonna take more money from me, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez? Are you gonna take less from me? And are you gonna punish me for making more money? And the answer to that question is absolutely. They would say, the more money you make, the more money you should pay. So if I'm, you know, and we already have a progressive tax system. So the more money I make, the higher percentage I have to pay, which is, I've always found to be weird. Okay. Why should I pay more for things? Right. Just because I make more. And it's not just that I'm paying more. Like, let's say I paid, let's pretend I make $10 an hour and you make $1 an hour. And they say, well, this candy bar will cost you 25% of, you know, your income. You take your dollar and that candy bar costs how much? 25 cents, right? I go and it costs me $2.50 because I make more, right? But that's not how the progressive tax system works. I already make, you'll notice you are, my, the cost of my candy bar is already 10 times higher than yours, right? The progressive tax system would say, as I go up in uh, wage, I don't just pay 25%, I pay more than 25%, so it would be more than that, right? Um, and with each level, it gets higher, okay? Now, obviously candy bars are not what we would be buying, you know, that's not how it works. But, but I mean, where does our money, where do our tax dollars go? They go to roads, federal roads, they go to our military, that mean they go to our police system, that means uh, the more money you're paying, you're getting the same, right? Right, I mean, you're driving on the same road I am. Are you paying just as much? And by the way, so, you know, those with lower income tend to not pay income tax, right? Because you get it back, you know? And so then, you hear Bernie Sanders and you hear AOC, these people need to pay their fair share. Well, if they're gonna pay their fair share, I'd suggest they're paying, they should pay less, okay? Why, now, now by the way, I'm not a billionaire. I just find it odd as a philosopher and in the, in, when we talk about justice equals being treated equally, right? Or distributive justice, equal pay for equal work, right? Or you pay for what you get, it just seems odd that the wealthy who get the same roads you get, the same police you get, the same fire department you get, the same military you get, the same, you get where I'm going with this, have to pay so much more for it. I find that odd, don't you? That to, to say that you owe more because you make more? Well, that's weird. That's a disincentive to make more in some regards. Um, he also said that we should change our healthcare system overall how it works at Canada. Yeah. Yes. So what she wants is a what's called a socialized medicine where there is uh, the government provides us healthcare. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what happens when the government provides you anything? Mm -hmm. This is a highly biased lecture towards <laughs> against socialism, by the way. Okay. <laughs> I don't care. Go ahead. You have to obey the government. I mean, when the government gives you something, it governs it. Mm -hmm. And when the, so I, I'm a veteran. I get government provided health care. The government tells me who my doctor is. Okay, they tell me if I could change doctors, and the answer to that question is no. They tell me what procedures are allowed, and that's all based on how much money the government has. Okay. I can't say, well, why don't you let me pay for it? They, well, in this case, they'd say, sure, go outside. But if the government takes it over, then you have no choice, okay? And then when they tell you your kid, and this happened in England twice, where there's children, the parents wanted to bring their kid to America to get treatment uh, for their dying kid, 
the government of England said, no, you cannot bring your child to America to get treatment. We govern their health care. Kid died, okay? Kid was gonna die, they believed anyway, but wouldn't you want to be able to give your chick kid the best chance possible? Well, uh, England said, we gave, some panel said, we gave you the best choice possible. There are no other choices that are allowed by our system. You will not take your kid to get further care. Is that what you, you know, I'm gonna say, is that what you want? <laughs> that's not what I mean to say, but I mean, of course, I assume like, hey, that's not the way it works. Well, that's the way it works, okay? I'm in the system, and that's how it, and now people from Canada come down to America to get uh, procedures in America. Why would they do that if their healthcare is so good up there? Well, because America has specialists down here in private healthcare where you could get better care, you get better surgeries, and you don't have to wait, right? So whenever there's government, there's a waiting list. Now, how many of you went to public schools? One, two, three, all. You did it. Now, President Obama sent his kids to uh, public schools because they're so good, right? No, he didn't. His kids went to the most elite private schools in the nation. In fact, his daughters went to the same elite school my wife went to highly elite, okay? And uh, why would they do that if public schools are so good? If the public system can provide just as good as the private system, why would we even have a private system, right? So she's advocating a governmental takeover of healthcare, all right? Where would you rather go, private? Or you're in private school right now. Where would you rather be, public or private? healthcare. Well, you know, pri public is not free, even though she would say it is. Public just means you pay for it through your taxes. That's what it means. You're still paying for it. You just pay for it through your taxes. That means your income, your check will get smaller. You won't have to worry about doctor bills, but you may have to worry about the quality of your care and your rights as a patient. Okay. Have a question. Go ahead. If, if hypothetically speaking, if like that was this, if that was the situation, what happens if you had to go to a, like a specialist, like going to MD Anderson, and you were sent to not to certain hospitals? Would you be able to go to MD Anderson if you have cancer? Or would you well, again, that that just depends on how the government decides to regulate it. They they may say, well, you're you you live in this area, you have to go to the government funded hospitals here. That that's like kind of like your school district. You go to your district hospitals. And only if um, there's a special case, could you do that? And they'd have an official way to ask permission to do that. In a private field, you just give them the middle finger and you say, I'm taking my records, I'm taking my business elsewhere. So again, um, I'm not saying that that's the way it would be, because um, I'm just saying it could be that way. Uh, you don't know until they set it up until they decide how they're gonna regulate your uh, your use of the system, okay? Because if I want, I can go to a doctor every day as long as I can afford it. Can you do that on, when the government's paying for it? I don't know. It may kick me out eventually. <laughs> you say, hey, you're cut off, man. You're done with your medical care. Who knows, I don't know. I mean, but, so, you know, a lot, okay, that's, but those are excellent things. So part of what we're discussing here is um, federalism and uh, to what degree should the government take over, the federal government take over certain things. When we talk about uh, forms of government, uh, America has a, uh, we're, f you know, a federal government, you know, where there's a republic. And what that does is it breaks down the areas of, um, you know, in, not just influence, but uh, governance. You have the three major ones. You have the federal government, you have the state government, you have the local government. In a unitary system, this is kind of what you'll need to know, the distinction between a federal government and a unitary system. 
in a unitary system, uh, the federal government rules all of these. Everything is a federal government. Everything, and if, for example, like in England, that would be a unitary system. Now, why do we have the federal system where we have state and local governments that are so different, like from Texas to California, we'll have state and local uh, you know, government, governments that are, are, are different than each other. Uh, the reason has to do with how America was created, how the Constitution was ratified. If you recall, we had 13 colonies, each of which had ruled themselves by and large, even though they were still under the crown, but they had distrusted that. And then when they had the revolution and they were now coming into their own country the article, under the Articles of Confederation, they didn't want all that power consolidated under one federal government. They feared that, they didn't like it, and they didn't want somebody from so far away telling them what to do where they were. But when they found out it wasn't working with Confed uh, Articles of Confederation, they had to give the federal government more power. They still tried to maintain a certain level of sovereignty. Now, what is sovereignty? Self-rule. Now, the debate has, between you know, federalism and anti-federalism had to do with that level of sovereignty that each state would maintain. And then when they ratified the Constitution, that's why you had compromises like the Three-Fifths Compromise. Because even though slavery was despised, they hated, you know, they had to compromise in order to ratify the Constitution. Okay, and this idea of creating the Senate, that was a compromise which gave you know, power to smaller states. So all these compromises took place. And so the fact that we have different governments under the, the big federal umbrella uh, has uh, been the result of compromise, but it also has done a lot. It divides powers and realms of authority and realms of responsibility. Now, is there overlap and is there debate? Well, yes. And so when you talk about AOC and her just, this is great uh, to bring that up because this emphasizes who controls what? Should the federal government control my health care? Who regulates health care? Should health care be regulated? I think to some degree that's good. I mean, come on, you don't want some guy down on the street corner selling you snake oil, right? You don't want some guy in a white lab coat, although they could put on, anybody could put on a white lab coat. But you don't want some doctor, doctor who didn't go to med school, right? Practicing medicine. I'd like them to go to med school. You know, not all doctors graduate in the top level of their class. You know that, right? You know what they call somebody who, who graduates at the bottom of his med school class? doctor, which is kind of scary. You know, how do you know which ones are good or bad, right? They're all called doctor, but at least they went to med school, right? So not all doctors are created equal, but at least they are doctors. And so there's some federal regulation of that. But should the federal government completely take over the healthcare system? And that's what she says, AOC otherwise known as Sandy Cortez. That's her real name. She changed it for political reasons. So, and there's a debate between them to currently. Now, let's talk about the realms of responsibility because this is, this is, what are the realms of responsibility for the federal government? What does the federal government do? We could continue along the lines of what's going on in the news, right? Um, what else is going on in the news? And I'll, 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 illust I'll we'll ask the question, which group, part of government is dealing with that? Anything else? Mm -hmm. No, that's it. And I mean, in most of the debate. In the debate? Both, yeah. What else was part of the debate? Did anybody else take note of what was discussed during the debate? 
abortion. Abortion. Thank you for saying that, because that's what's on my mind. You read my mind. <laughs> um, prior to Roe versus Wade and Casey versus Planned Parenthood, um, it was uh, abortion was regulated by the states. Okay, so what if what if Texas outlawed abortion? Can they do that? What would happen? I think people would just leave to go to different states to go get it. Yeah, but they're not going to get it here. Yeah. That's all fine and well. Okay. Um, let's pretend that uh, Oklahoma, uh, Texas, Louisiana, some other southern states, let's just say, you know, Florida. And now all of a sudden, there are a lot of people, they're like, women are having a hard time getting abortions and they're mad, what are they gonna do about it? Take them to court, say that you're violating our constitutional right to get an abortion, and then what's gonna happen? They're gonna go to take it all the way to the, they'll take it originally, we'll, when we get to the court section, we'll talk about you know, uh, how people choose which court to go to, okay? They'll find somebody in a, a state like Texas and they'll say, take it to the court and lose so they can appeal it to the Supreme Court. So you can get the court to say, you states have passed laws that are unconstitutional and you have to follow this now. You have to allow abortions. Those laws are null and void. But of course, in the debate, the biggest problem was is Donald Trump is nominating a woman to the court. And that's interesting because this woman is despised by the left where they normally would love this, uh, but she is a Catholic. And what's the problem with Catholics? Any Catholics in here? I'm Catholic. Are you a Catholic or are you a Catholic? I'm a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't catch the nuance. <laughs> Catholics, the Catholic uh, view on abortion is you don't do it. It's morally wrong. It is murder. Okay. Which, by the way, is the evangelical Christian view too. Okay. But it's official in the Catholic Church. You understand that, right? Okay. Joe Biden, who is a Catholic, as with Nancy Post Pelosi, right? Uh, they say it's okay to have abortions. Okay, they're just like, man, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. But that's not the Catholic position. And the problem with this lady that is uh, being nominated, she's a real Catholic. Not to say Joe Biden's a fake Catholic, but she takes it seriously. Which means she's five, and there will be four who would disagree. There are five conservatives on the bench, and there will be four non-conservatives on the bench. Roe vs. Wade could easily be overturned. You just bring it before the court. And so now you ask the question, does the court, does the federal government have the right to regulate whether states allow abortions or not? Or is it a state's rights thing? So I mean, just because Roe vs. Wade gets, his, gets overturned, that doesn't make abortion illegal. It just means the states now make the decision as to whether or not they will allow abortion. And thus, if Roe versus Wade were overturned, Texas could then create a law that outlawed abortion. And that big abortion clinic down by U of H could be demolished, okay? It's the largest abortion clinic in America. So that could happen. And the majority of, uh, seems to be in favor of s severely limiting or even abolishing abortion, okay, in America. What, um, so it's a very highly contentious, this is an issue. And you ask the question, we have healthcare and then People call this healthcare. I don't call abortion healthcare, okay? There's nothing healthy about it. Nobody walks in or out of a, 
uh, out of an abortion clinic healthier than they came in, okay? I can promise you that. Abortion's especially not uh, healthy for the person getting aborted, okay? Uh, but the women who actually have them are actually less healthy mentally, spiritually, and physically leaving, okay? Now, what's another issue? Because those are two major issues, right? Uh, fighting between who's in control, who has sovereignty over whom. What's the other, uh, give me another issue. What else does the federal government control? Military? Okay. What about highways? Who pays for those? It's the government, federal. Federal. Highway interstates. Okay. Um, and that's a way the government can control the speed limit. The federal government, does the federal government control our speed limits? Technically, no. Like if we wanted to have a 90 degree, 90 degree, a 90 uh, mile an hour speed limit on our freeways, we could do it. What if the federal government did not want that? What would they do? Withhold the money to fix our highways. And then we go, well, we want that money. And they say, well, then change your laws. Okay, so there's this clash between uh, fight, uh, fight between the governments, in a sense, over who has more control over what issues, their realm and sphere of influence. Uh, what's another one that the, uh, what, what does the state control? Elections. Federal elections. Okay, they'll all be... You know, the, the presidency is all coming up and, and the date is determined, but how those elections take place is determined, the hows and the wheres is determined by the states. And so there's a major fight right now over mail in ballots. That was in the debate too. So each state gets to make their own determination over certain things like that. Uh, the state can determine state standards having to do with education. So, you know, they all have education standards, textbook standards. So in Texas, there's a major, uh, there are textbook wars in a sense. Who controls what our students read in the classroom, right? It becomes a big state, state debate over what textbooks are going to be used. And then, so you have to, you have these people fighting over it. Should we allow the founding fathers, should we allow the state schools to teach the religious influences of the founding fathers? It is a historical set of information, right? It, it is historical, right? And it, and it did have an effect on them. Should that be taught? Well, some people say no, because if you do so, you're trying to influence the students towards religion. So we need to treat, we need to get rid of all references to religion, right, in, in these books. So the state determines that, but that's at the state level. And so people get together and they fight over this at the state level. You know, why is this a problem? Now, certain, now why is this a problem in Texas? It's not for us, but I mean, people like in Oklahoma, which probably don't, they don't care, but other book markets, like let's imagine you're a book distributor, who are you? And you're going to produce a, a history book, right? And you sell to Colorado, New Mexico, Texas, and Oklahoma. In fact, you sell all over the world, but that's your major market. Colorado, New Mexico are going to get upset or at Texas because why? Well, because the bookmaker is going to, they're gonna go where the highest number of books are being sold, right? And they're gonna go with what Texas wants. So they may include the faiths of the fathers. Well, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where I'm from, uh, just New Mexico in general, and Colorado, those are very, very liberal states. And they're not exactly very, um, uh, congenial, nice to religion. So they'd want to get rid of the religious references in those books, but they're all mad because, you know, Texas is now determining what's going on in the books 
uh, that their students are going to read, and they're like, I don't want these people reading anything about religion, you know. But they're but at the state level, these things are, are determined, and that's a, that that that's highly contentious. The federal government doesn't necessarily get into any of that. Uh, let's see what else they uh, they write down that um, sheriffs. Uh, marriage and divorce. Now, at a time, there used to be a time where states would determine who it could and could not get divorced. Can you marry your cousin? You can? No. Are you sure? Third cousin? Not even your third cousin? Isn't it? In, it's still incest. I don't know. We're all related somehow. I mean, third cousin's like, um, so my guy I call my cousins the second my really my second cousin and he is the son of my actual cousin okay so I think his daughter from a, another woman is she may be my third cousin not that she'd be really young but that'd be pretty far removed wouldn't it? not far enough I don't think so. I mean, it's close, I feel like. Yeah. There's a whole lot of people out there. It's a little you know? too, you know, there's more <laughs> limbs on the, on the tree than, you know, you don't want a one limb family tree, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. This is my sister and my wife, and there's only one person <laughs> standing next to you. <laughs> yeah, we don't want that. Uh, states can determine that, okay? Uh, that became a big issue in the 90s, the millennium, and then up to recently with same-sex marriage, where uh, up until the Obama administration, presidents, uh, even Obama as a senator, uh, w was against same-sex marriage. And this idea that the government, listen to this, that the government would determine or put their stamp on a relationship, which I find odd to begin with that the governments have anything to do with marriage. Why does the go why do you need a marriage, you know, I have an answer to this, but why, why does the government, why do you have to have a license to get married? Well, of course, a lot of it had to do with regulating that kind of stuff. Let's not, you know, be marrying your, your, your sister, you know, but, um, like taxes and stuff? There's, there's some tax issues, that, that tax benefits. But the taxes are usually, and they usually say they're benefits to the married people, they're write-offs and families and stuff. The government, what, what interest does the government have in families? Uh, there's a sense that uh, the family unit uh, is the building block of society, and thus we build societies on the basis of families. Okay, so determining what a legitimate family is, uh, especially in the way of any kind of governmental endorsement or benefit, you know, take the, the state, by the state I just mean government in general, will take an interest in it to regulate it. We're going to regulate this. In a weird way, it's kind of regulating morality. Okay? Um, home, there's certain relations that the government deems to be immoral, reprehensible, pedophiles. You know, marrying your daughter who's 10 years old seems to be reprehensible. Not just gross, but morally bad. That the government's not going, not neither gonna endorse, but they're not gonna allow it either, okay? And for a time, up until recently, that was a view of homosexuality. So, the same-sex uh, marriage debate was about getting the government to endorse this lifestyle as legitimate. And in doing so, there are certain advantages now that this community gets and protections and weapons to use against those who disagree with them, okay? Such as bringing lawsuits against people who refuse to bake cakes for them. Uh, bringing lawsuits against people and charges against people who refuse to do uh, have uh, use their photography companies to uh, you know take wedding photographs and stuff and you can 
charge them with as they did in Elaine photography okay uh, so anyway those are those are issues dealt with by the state which were actually taken up uh, in a federal case Obergefell v Hodges and the federal government stepped in on that one okay uh, local what does a local government do cities how many of you live in a city all of you what city do you live in? Houston. Houston. And which one do you live in? Houston. Okay, wow, we're you know, spreading it out, right? Mm -hmm. Houston? Yeah. Yeah. Houston? Yeah. Are you sure? Like, like you mean like at home or like right now? Let's go with home. Uh, I'm from Friendswood, like Reed City area. Uh, is that up north? Uh, where's that? No, it's South Houston. South Houston. See, it's up there. But its own, it's its own little municipality. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I, you'd think I'd know this. <laughs> you say League City. I should know this. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not that good. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So where? And you're Houston, Houston. Yeah. So I lived in uh, for a little bit West University place. Okay. And when people ask where you're from, I'd be like, well, I live in Houston. Not really, I lived in West University, even though it's in the center of Houston, right? Down by the medical district. And you live in Houston, Houston, not in anything like Bel Air or anything like that. Well, I live like close, I guess would be the Memorial area. So okay, yeah, so I live in the Memorial area now, okay? I'm still in Houston though. Mm -hmm. But there's like, in the Memorial area, you've got uh, Spring Branch, right? Mm -hmm. And then you've got uh, Piney Point, you live in Piney Point. Village. The villages? Yeah, what? all the villages. Yeah, yeah, Bunker Hill. Yeah. Those are their own little cities. Those are that, those are not Houston. They literally cannot vote um, in Houston's elections. They vote on their own city council. So what do those little cities do? What what do they what do you get out of that? What do they do for you? Who takes out your trash? Well, I take out our trash, but who takes my trash away? The city, right? Who deals with your sewage? The city. Who deals with your utilities? The city. Who determines what types of buildings can be placed where? Usually the city, right? You're not gonna build a skyscraper in the middle of a, yeah, you are in Houston, but in housing development, you know, your next door neighbors is high rise. You're like, what the heck? You know, not a whole lot of zoning going on here. Well, that's interesting because it's usually the villages are, are like, cause it's metro trying to expand out, you know, trying to, and so the the metro and the head of the villages don't see eye to eye. Of course not. No, I mean, who, there's a, there's a saying called NIMBY, okay? It's usually in um, uh, well, business uh, in, uh, you know, if you get an MBA or something, you'll, you'll hear it's not in my backyard. Right? You know, everybody's all big on windmills until you find out they're gonna put it right next to your house. You're like, not in my backyard, you're not. Put a thousand windmills out there, look at me, you're like, oh my God, what just happened here? Right? Um, you know, it comes down to, you know, nuclear, it was like for nuclear, then they're gonna put a power plant right next to your, you know, eh, yeah, I don't want, not in my backyard, because I don't want it melting down and, you know, my property turned into Chernobyl. Who knows who, what Chernobyl is? a nuclear meltdown in Russia in the 80s and uh, anyway place is still toast okay well anyway so um, you're right so there you go so each of the so these little municipalities actually will keep certain things at bay they'll, they'll, they'll zone and say nope you can't build that here and they'll say we're gonna pick up your trash twice a week Right? And you're gonna put your recycling in these little blue buckets, okay? And you're gonna break up your cardboard box, and if you don't, we're gonna leave it. And if your lid is just halfway up, we're gonna leave it, right? Okay, so they regulate that stuff, and you provide taxes to them through property taxes and the like, okay? Uh, sewage, trash, utility, police, fire! Who are you gonna call? I remember, okay, so I got ripped off at West U. Who did I have to call? Uh, West U police. I didn't call. Some guy, you know, broke into our house the night before we moved from West U to um, where we are now. 
and he's like shopping in our house. He walks out with my guitar amp, and he walks out. He's a practice amp, not a big one. It would be pretty hard for him to do that. But he's got a guitar amp. He's got my iPad. He took a camera and my whole camera bag. I mean, he, he took all, took my truck. Tried to start my brand new truck, but he couldn't get it in gear. <laughs> and uh, so the police, I didn't. I, I saw him get in because I had I had this all on video. You know, my wife and I, my dog slept through the whole thing. <laughs> you know, so it's totally hanging out. <laughs> Barks at everything, but he did. He let this guy go. Anyway, they did. Who did I call? I called uh, Westview Police. They took some prints. He left his flashlight in my guitar. Uh, never got anything back. In fact, I think it was like six months later they finally said, "Oh yeah, we didn't find a print." Anyway, um, so because they had to ship ship it off because they didn't have their own, you know, crime scene investigation lab, so they had to ship it off to Houston, I suppose, and pay them. And there's no crime in Houston, so they got to it right away. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, point being, uh, they were in charge of the investigation. Okay. And so that was, if my house burns down, who's going to come? The fire department from my city. Okay. In this case, I have Houston now. I'm, I, I, I'm in the big, you know, I'm not in one of those you know, villages or anything. Very close, but not, not in them. All right, so um, the 10th Amendment is the amendment that I know we're jumping from, we didn't even discuss the first nine amendments of the you know, Bill of Rights, but the 10th Amendment was an issue that discusses the rights of the states in relation to the federal government. It says whatever's not basically covered or expressed by the Constitution about the federal government, those are the powers that the states have. Now, why is that a big deal? Because the states wanted to retain their power and that amendment you know, made sure that um, that was the case. I don't wanna discuss Dylan's rule right now or home rule. Those have to do with who determines local authority in the cities and, you know, that's about that. Let's go back to a couple things. The other day, if you saw the video we were um, watching, we were discussing, we actually went, uh, discussed treason in America. Uh, I want you guys to uh, watch that video and ask the question, uh, what's going on in America with groups like Antifa and say Black Lives Matter, not the movement of Black Lives Matter that's arguing say, hey, we need reform and we need justice in the sense of police reform and justice so that people are treated equally. Not that act. We're talking about the groups within uh, them that say we need to overthrow America, we need to change the system, we need to burn it down. When AOC says this is a call to radicalize, you ask the question, at what, what point does this stuff breach a line where the government is not just being asked to, be, uh, to make reformations, uh, to be reformed, that is, um, in such a way as to be more just, say, look, we can apply this better uh, to where we're saying we're gonna burn it down and replace it. This is an issue that is going on. That, now this is from the, uh, I'm just bringing it back from the last lecture. We got, if I'm correct, 15 minutes. This is what I want you to do is I want us to take out our handy dandy constitution, not, uh, not to stick on the subject of, of that, but I just wanna remind you uh, and those watching to go back and kind of consider, you know, what's going on in our country right now as a, a you know, um, current event, so that we ask the question, is it time to just change our government? Uh, we, I heard yesterday in a discussion, somebody mentioned that democracies really just have a shelf life of a couple hundred years. And America has gone past that quite a, a little bit. And, it is no surprise to anybody for us to say that we're a very divided nation right now. So is it time that we just institute the great divorce and decide to tell the kids we're breaking up? And you know, New York's gonna go its own way 
Texas is going to go to Hawaii. And if you want to burn down your monuments in your own state, you can. You keep your own, do whatever you want, take your ball and go home. Is it time to do that? Has the American constitutional experiment come to an end? And is it time to move on? What do you guys think? Is that heavy? What? Is that a heavy question or? Uh, I, no, I don't think America should break up. Why not? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's worked for. Has it? Uh, is it working? Uh, I can be changed to work better. Can it? How? What does what does Texas really have in common with New York? Now my wife's from New York. I met her in New York, New York City Marathon. And when I told her to come down to Texas, she's like, I'm not gonna go down there, you bunch of racists. <laughs> right? Thought we were all going around on cows, that we were a bunch of rednecks, right? And they were a bunch of racists. How do you feel about that, being called a racist? And you know why she believed that? Because that's what a lot of people believe in New York, and she just went with it, right? Of course, I, I convinced her one truth. She came down, she goes, oh my God, you guys are so nice. <laughs> she's like, I don't know. And she's like, where are all these racists these people talk about, right? Her own best friend dis disowned her, okay? <laughs> um, and I got something here. So, um, but I mean, come on, I mean, they, they, they want to do things differently than we do. They like, they like certain things. They, they want those kind of, they want that kind of health care up there. The majority of people, not all of them, right? But the majority of the people down here want to keep our own health care. We don't want government in our, in our business like that. Um, they're very strict on, you know, they, they, on guns. They don't like guns. They don't want guns. Legally gun, owned guns. They have plenty of illegal guns up there. I can promise you that. But Texas, we're like, we like guns, you know? And it's like, hey, you just had a baby? Well, nice. Hey, here's a gun, you know? <laughs> Your baby's first gun, <laughs> you know? Um, what are you gonna do? I mean, when they, they, they're trying, what happens when they win and they say, uh, Texans, you no longer can own guns and we're gonna come get them. Are you gonna go, okay, here's we go. Or are you gonna say no, come and take it? I don't feel like it should be, I think like, I don't think they should, like we should split up. I think that, I mean, I guess it just should be the state's choice on how they wanna own guns, but that's a federal thing. That's in the Bill of Rights, right? The right to bear arms, Second Second Amendment, freedom of religion, First Amendment. Should they be able to regulate this and to what degree? And what happens when they regulate it out of existence? And you go, wait a minute. Then they're violating this. And you go, well, you violated this, so we, you know. So you go, and when they just go, well, look, we just want to get rid of it. And they do. Many of them do. Beto O'Rourke says, you know, Robert Francis O'Rourke says, yeah, I want to take your gun. Now, he's a Texan. He's, you know. So, well, let's read this until it's gone, until we, get, until we break up and we're no longer under it. Um, I want to go and talk a little bit about Congress. Let's, we, we, we skimmed it, but we didn't go through all of it. I want us to know... Article 2 of the Constitution. Okay. Did I say Article 2? That's the presidency. I apologize. Article 1, Section 2. Uh, we, we already kind of went through Article 1, Section 1, and where we talked about all legislative powers here and granted shall be vested in the Congress of the United States. Right? And it shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives. So we talked about the bicameral nature of our legislative branch of government. In section two, it talks about the House of Representatives and it talks about 
the requirements of being in the House of Representatives, and a bit about what they do. What were the requirements of being in the House? How old do you have to be? 25, that's right. And how often are these people chosen? Every two years. Every two years. So that, that means uh, you can get a high turnover rate. You may not, but it means that they're constantly being challenged, or at least possibly challenged, okay? Uh, we also determined that the uh, Electoral College, remember, is determined by the number of state representatives and the Senate. Now, what happens if somebody dies or quits or gets kicked out of office at, in the House of Representatives? How do the, how should we re, re, uh, fill these things, right? Well, it turns out the state authority, which is usually our governor, can fill such a vacancy and then they will fill that until the next election. Uh, this happened, there's a, uh, a senator, if I'm correct, yeah, a senator in Arizona. So it's the same for House and the uh, Senate. Uh, I forget her name, I'm, I apologize. Uh, she's filling the role of somebody who, who it, it made the seat vacant. And now she is, uh, McCain died, that's what it was. And she was placed in his uh, spot. And now she's up for re-election. Okay, she's the incumbent. She wasn't actually elected, she was appointed by the governor. Interesting. Um, there is a um, Rod Blagojevich. Who knows that name? Governor of Illinois for a while. Spent, if I'm correct, the last six or seven years in jail. Because when President Obama, who was a senator, left his seat allegedly, which it was found to be the case, Blagojevich was going to sell his seat on the Senate. And so he got busted for corruption. Interesting, huh? So that's Chicago politics for you. You need to sell the seat to the highest bidder. Want to see to you know, be a senator? Now just tell me how much you're willing to pay. I got an open. I've got the. I've got the opening. Well, section three talks about the Senate, and it talks now the distinction between the Senate and the House has to do with two things. One, the age, which is what. Uh, the age difference is five years. Oh, yeah, it goes 25 to 30, okay? And then when they started this constitution, they put them in a rotation, okay? So that a third of the senators were gonna be up for election in two years, the next ones would be up for in four years, the next one's six years. But how long are the terms now for each senator? six years, which is three times the length of the House of Representatives. And there are two senators per state, which we had already decided. The, the, the House, it's the lower chamber, and we decided, we didn't decide this, but it is determined by population. Now here's the thing. Oh, with the House, I, I, I failed to mention um, that you don't have to be a naturalized citizen. You can be a citizen of seven years, okay? So if you wanna be in the House of Representatives, are you a citizen of the United States of America? Yes. How long have you been in America? Since I was born. Since you were born, but you have this distinct accent. Yeah, maybe because of my family, they don't speak English, so. Okay, so that, that, that's excellent. That's very cool. So, um, so you're a naturalized citizen. But let's pretend you moved here from where are you from, your family originally. My mom's from Dallas. My dad's. No, I mean originally. Originally, like. Yeah, European. Oh, Scotland. <laughs> Scotland. Uh -huh. Let's imagine you came from Scotland and you're here, and you're like, I want to be a, a House of Representative, you know, in the House, right? And uh, they're like, How long have you been here? Three years. They're like, sorry, you can't. You gotta be here how many? Seven, right? Good. 
So you have to be 25 years and you have to be there seven years and you have to live right in the state that you're actually representing. Now this is an interesting thing because imagine some of these, what they call swamp dwellers, you know, they go off to DC and they own an apartment up there and they stay up there until they have to come back to the state to which they represent you know, and just to be reelected, then they're like, I'm moving back to DC. Are you really an inhabitant of the state or are you, or are you, uh, or are you really an inhabitant of DC? So, so this is telling them they actually have to inhabit the state. And the same thing for the Senate, okay? So the Senate says, now with the Senate, okay, um, let me see here. You have to be 30 years, not seven years, but nine years, okay? So the, the standards are upped a bit. And of course, uh, you have to be an inhabitant of the state for which you were elected to represent. Now here's the interesting thing. Here's a trick question. It's not really a trick question. Can you hold more than one office at once? If you're in the Senate. The answer is no not really a trick question it's stating it right there okay and that's important and then who is going to be the president of the senate the vice president of the united states and what is the importance of him what does the vice president do how many votes does the vice president get on any legislation well how many votes does do, do the uh House of Representatives, how many votes do they get per piece? Depends on the population. Well, they get a vote once, right? At least on the legislation, uh, right? Yeah. It depends on if they're in the committee. Now, that's a whole, did they get a vote there? But once it's out of committee and you're voting on it, we'll talk about that later, okay? Um, they get one vote. Senators get how many? One vote. How many does the uh, president of the Senate get? No. What? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. In what case can the vice president, otherwise known as the president of the Senate, get to vote in the Senate at all? When there's a tie. When there's a tie. And how many and there can be ties. Why? Because there are a hundred senators, right? Because there are fifty states, two two senators per state. And in that case, if there's a tie, the vice president can come in and break the tie which is great, especially now with the confirmation of a new Supreme Court justice. If, and it's very close, right, to get this person confirmed, if it turned out to be what? 50 to 50? Who comes in? Mike Pence. Mike Pence is the president's, President Trump's vice president, right? Do you think he's gonna vote against the Trump administration's pick? Probably not. Okay, so that so in that regard, that's how they would be uh, get their get their uh, vote. Okay, I think we've run out of time. I do want us to read all of Article One to make sure you know the distinction between the House and the Senate. All those little types of questions are gonna be on quizzes. Okay. And there'll be another quiz coming up. All right, with that, we can shut that down.